Rarely people talk about clowning as a powerful and invigorating art form. And yet here I am. I've been working on this documentary for five years, following the clowns. And I'm giving this talk on the weekend when it comes out. <laughs> I think it's meaningful. I think I'm here to turn around the American opinions about the clowns because you guys are alone in that sad corner of fear. <laughs> Nobody outside is aware of the fear of clowns. In Israel, hospitals hire professional clowns and incorporate them into the protocols and the procedures of the hospital so that clowns work with kids, with adults, with the families, with the staff, with the entire environment of the hospital to make it less stressful and a little more tolerable for everyone. And I'm going to give you a heads up. I'm going to show a video right now with the clowns. There's no white face whatsoever, no creepiness, no weirdness, just awesome, super special Israeli medical clowns. Let's roll. It's not just to make him laugh, it's how to communicate. I think that I'm addicted to medical clowning. The red nose is like a license to talk to anybody you want. It's amazing. It's beautiful, it's fun, it's sad, it's tragic, it's happiness, it's the only thing that combines life. The hard moment in clowning, it's the great moment. This is part of what I'm doing, something that I choose to do in my life. So I've been following them for a few years and I've learned a lot about them. But I also realized that in the process, I've learned some cool lessons from them. And uh, I would like to share them with you. So here are my five and a half lessons of clown wisdom learned from the Israeli clowns, who are the jesters of the hospital kingdom. Lesson number one, embrace the chaos. We're used to hearing, oh, don't try to control everything. Just let go. Well, to me, let go feels like defeat. It's sad and passive. And the clowns have taught me to be active and to embrace the chaos. Hospital is the kingdom of order. Everything has to be color-coded, measured, structured. And this is the way it has to be for the hospital to run. And this is the way we want it to be when we happen to be in the hospital. We want order. We want somebody in control. And the doctors and nurses do their best with their lab courts and charts to show that they are in control and the order they bring. Because to them, a patient is a body that's out of order, that needs to be brought back to order. So they bring those regiments, diets, and rules, which we then hate. When the order is imposed on us, we can't even feel alive. Because the truth is, we are just as much creatures of chaos as we are creatures of order. So that's when the clown comes in. The clown walks in and by playfully challenging the doctor's authority, helps us feel a little bit more alive. And they're not disturbing the rules. One of them actually told me, we're not breaking the rules. We're breaking all around, between the rules. They're carefully orchestrating that chaos to help us feel alive. Because the order is not the relief. Embrace the chaos. Lesson number two, be present. Modern technology has tricked us into that feeling that we're always present everywhere. We're checking everything, we're connecting with everyone all the time. But the truth is that we're more disconnected than ever before. We break up over text. We express condolences via emoji. Prayers, sad face. The ability to be physically and emotionally present is becoming a disappearing art. And that ability in the hospital has an extra value because let's be honest, we would all much rather be absent from it than present in it. All we want is an escape and we're there. The truth is, and that's what clowns have taught me, that indeed you can escape, but only by being present. See, the clown's work in the hospital is not a show, it's not a shtick. What they do is a non-stop improvisation. 
and they have to be really present when they walk into the room. They don't know what they're walking into. They have to be really present to assess the room within two seconds and address it correctly. Because the moment before can be filled with pain and fear and fighting and tears. And the moment after can be filled with more suffering and sometimes nothingness. It's the present that we have the power over. That's when the clown magic happens. And I've seen it. I followed a clown into a patient's room, isolation unit actually, in the cancer ward. A man in his 60s, after a bone marrow transplantation, attached to a morphine sack with 50-50 chances of survival, moaning from pain. Clown breaks into a silly cannabis prayer song. And moments later, the guy joins her. Did the prayer save his life? No. He didn't make it into the right 50%. But then and there, in that moment, it made all the difference, not only for him, but also for his family and the memories that they get to have for the rest of their lives. And oftentimes, those situations are really, really difficult on the families. There have been some mentions here. People don't know how to be. People don't know how to be present for their loved ones. It's really hard. I've been there. And what people do, they build walls of complacency and denial to protect themselves. And then they regret for the rest of their lives. One of the clowns told me a story. He worked with a patient who was dying from cancer. And he wanted to talk to his children about it. And they would just brush it off. Oh, what are you talking about? It's nonsense. You're going to get better soon. Just stay positive. You're going to get better soon. And he knew he was not going to get better soon. He was going to die soon. And he had to talk to them about it. And they wouldn't. So he turned to the clown and said, man, you know, I'm going to stop farting soon. And the clown knew exactly what the man told him. And he said, oh, how sad. I love your farts. <laughs> I'm going to miss them so much. And then he turned to the kids and said, aren't you going to miss them? And they went on and on and on with that stupid joke about farts. But being adults, they all knew what they're really talking about. And if you cannot utter the word death, and you have to say fart, better. And in that moment, the clown helped bring that family into the present and be there for each other. So be present. Every moment is precious. Lesson number three, give up your social status. That's my favorite. Don't we all love our social statuses? We're this or that, race, nationality, religion, party, class. We buy all of our trinkets to belong to the right sliver that we want to belong. And we feel really comfortable. We feel very happy to know that we are not them, right? But this is how the society begins to divide. The clown, the jester, doesn't apply any of those definitions to himself. He's outside the grid, one with everyone. He doesn't ignore the definitions that others apply to themselves, but he reaches right past them to the human essence of the person. That's what he talks to. That's what responds to him. The clown almost doesn't look like quite a human. Once the nose is on, it's a creature, right? Certainly not an adult. Children view the clown as a superhero. Oh my God, he's unafraid of doctors. He does the most outrageous things and gets away unpunished. Whoa. Adults see him as a fool who they can share their deepest fears with and not be judged. In Israel, this ability to be one with everyone has an extra value. See, the society is as fractured as it is diverse. And in the hospital, everybody's cramped together. Religious and secular people, Arabs and Jews, Russian immigrants and Ethiopian immigrants, people don't even speak the same language, but they have to share the hospital rooms in the moments of crisis. 
gibberish comes in very handy. And so does this ability of connecting and being one with everyone. A girl clown told me a story. Uh, she lives not far from Jerusalem with her husband and kids in one of the settlements, which is a disputed territory between Arabs and Jews. She works in a hospital nearby. And she became particularly friendly with, with one Arab family who were there with their young kid. One day she was driving home and she saw them at the bus stop. And she knew that from that bus stop they could only be going to that same village where she lives. She knew they were her neighbors. For a moment she hesitated, should I give them the ride or not? And she, she decided not to and she felt guilty. But she knew that if the family were to find out that she's a Jewish settler, that the clown who their kid is playing with is on the other side, the kid would lose a friend and the family would lose the support. So she chose to keep her clown anonymous. So when social divides are out of the picture, that's when the real human connection can be made. That's a hard one, right? Throw away your ego. We don't like that one. But truly, throw it away for a moment. Drop it. it won't break. It's ego, not an egg. That's what clowns do. When they walk into the patient's room, they don't come in to impose their act on their audience. That would be rather rude. The audience didn't buy the tickets to that show. They're trapped there. They can't leave. So the clown has to tune in into what they really need in that moment and create a tailor-made piece of art for them right there. Part of the beauty of clowning in the hospital is that the act wouldn't even exist without the audience. There's no stage, no fourth wall to break. The audience is right there. They are part to creating that moment. And whatever is happening with them becomes the art. And there's a lot of negativity in the hospital. A lot of fear, anger, frustration. And it all has to come out. It's very apparent with the kids because they don't even understand why they have to be there. Why do I have to wait? Why do I have to suffer? Why? And where the adult can be, well, I'm not happy with the management of this hospital. I'm going to file a complaint. The kid's going to just scream his lungs out. So when the clown works with the kid, he always either crouches or goes on his knees to be on the same level, to be with him. And he will allow the kid destroy his costume and makeup and hit him. Actually, one of our clowns who we've been following, he walks around the hospital with a hollow plastic baseball bat. God does he get hit dozens of times a day because kids are frustrated and he's willing to take it so that another kid doesn't have to. With adults, it's a slightly more refined game, but the essence is the same. The clowns just create an environment where the person can express whatever is happening with them. One of the clowns, the same guy who did the farting bit, he works a lot with adult patients who go through chemo. It's a long process, so he has to build a relationship over time. And the way he does it is through creating art together. And most of those people have never created any art before. And what they do is songs and plays and little videos. And through those pieces, the patients get to express their fear. They talk about their disease. They talk about their relationships. And the clown is always in the background, letting the patient to shine in all those videos because he knows it's not about him. And believe me, the artist's ego is alive and well in clowns. I know all about it. <laughs> They're not monks. But when in hospital, when with the patient, they will take whatever they have to take and give whatever they can to support the patient. Because they know that when you make the other person feel like they're the most important person in the world, that's when they open up. That's when you can really connect. That's when you can really feel alive. And it goes both ways for the patient and for the clown. Don't know. 
say, I don't know. It's the biggest motivational speaker cliche, right? It is so for a reason. Because in order to learn anything, you need to say, I don't know. I need to find out. In order to fix a mistake, you need to say, I don't know, maybe I messed up. In order to feel, you need to say, I don't know, and it doesn't matter. To go beyond, you need to forget the limits. You need to not know the limits. And the clowns are real pros at that. They don't, they're not into the knowing stuff. Because knowing just disturbs the imagination. And in the hospital, the knowing can be particularly heavy. And it's the clown's job to lift that heaviness. One of the clowns told me a story about how he danced with a paralyzed woman. She had control over half of her face and some sensation in her hand. He walked in, he saw her, and he said, oh my god, let's dance. Clearly, as an adult man, he knows she can't dance. But as a clown, he chose not to know it. She rejected him. All of a sudden, all the power is in her corner. He's heartbroken. How come? Am I not good enough? Am I not dressed to the occasion? It took him days. But he made her. He convinced her to dance with him. Granted, the hand did most of the physical movement, but they danced because he didn't know it was impossible. See, the clowns don't rely on knowledge. They're fools. They think with their heart. And finally, poke the king. The clowns have taught me that there is an inherent value to mischief, to disrupting the order, disturbing the rules. And this is what brought us here from the caves. If not for that spirit, we would have been still living in the caves. And we are all born with that spirit of challenging the boundaries and exploring. Ask any parent of a five-year-old. All they do is challenge the boundaries. But by the time we grow up, we know the boundaries all too well. We don't even care to test them anymore. Well, what a pity. Galileo, Einstein, Warhol, Steve Jobs were not clowns. Yet they knew the value of challenging the order, expanding the boundaries. They had the clown spirit, that's for sure. And clowns themselves, they don't have an on and off button. They're just dial up or dial down a little bit, but they take that clown spirit into all of their life situations. They have told me how they used it at the bank, in the army, at the divorce court, at the office, at their boss, at the hospital. And one of them told me, you know, when I see a rule, when I see a boundary, what I do is I stand right at the very edge and I put my foot in front of me and I smile. And more often than not, the boundary bends. So, poke the king. It's liberating. Thank you.